Hi, I'm Paul Harper. I'm Professor of Operational Research and Head of the OR Group at Cardiff University School of Mathematics. In this short video, I'm going to provide an overview of our collaboration with the Welsh Ambulance Service, although the tools and methods uh, that are shown here could in principle be applied to other countries. The majority of the work has been led by two talented PhD students, Leanne and Julie, supervised by myself and several colleagues. The collaboration, in fact, arose from personal needs uh, to call for an ambulance on two occasions several years ago now for my three-year-old child. We had to wait over 45 minutes on both occasions for an ambulance to arrive, which as a parent is quite scary when you're helpless waiting for assistance. So it turned out when I started to research about the performance of the Welsh Ambulance Service at that time, it was failing to meet government set response time targets. And moreover, there was large variability of performance depending on where you lived in Wales. In fact, where we lived had some of the worst response times in the country, and Wales had the worst response times in the United Kingdom. Another reported problem was about long delays in transferring patients from ambulances to A&E departments, or EDs, as they tend to be known in other countries. So I started talking to the ambulance service, and that has led to some exciting collaboration, resulting in the themes of the work which I'm now going to outline in this talk. In summary, there are three main areas of contribution, forecasting demand, exploring response times and assisting with staff and crew rostering, and in the location and deployment of emergency vehicles across a region. This plot shows the daily number of emergency calls for an ambulance, or 999 in the UK, to the service over a five year period. And the service covers a population of about three million people. And you can see typically it gets about a thousand calls per day and there's been an overall trend or increase in demand of about 5% over that period. And you might be interested to note that the extreme points there, shown with the red circles above, are actually all in fact New Year's Day, when the service uh, experiences a huge demand. The time series contains cyclic patterns such as weekly and yearly repeated patterns that can be teased out on further analysis. And we ask ourselves the following question, can we predict demand on a given day or time period into the future? And if so, then advanced information can greatly assist in planning resource levels such as a number of ambulances and crews to meet this demand. Julie explored a number of forecasting techniques, including the more traditional and widely used methods like Holt Winters and Arima. She had a lot of success using a relatively new technique called Singular Spectrum Analysis, or SSA for short. And this graph shows the accuracy of forecasts for the very last month of the time series shown before, where we held back the data for December and evaluated the accuracy of the methods to forecast 31 days for that month. An SSA was shown to be superior overall, but as can be seen, more closely follows the actual true demand, and it was the only technique that captured December demand rises throughout the month. This improved accuracy was repeated for other months, and in summary, we have a forecasting tool that can predict tomorrow's demand, or say that within a week or a month, with excellent accuracy, typically within 3-4% to of what actually happens. Moving our attention to response times now, we wish to make use of our improved demand forecast to look at corresponding suggestions for scheduling resources to meet response time targets. Calls are actually in fact triage for priority purposes and there are several categories of calls with the highest priority category A requiring a response time within 8 minutes. And In fact the current Welsh Government set target is that 65% of all category A calls are seen within the 8 minutes. This plot shows the within day time dependency of demand exerted on the service for the South East region. Immediately you can see that during the daytime, from about 10 o'clock onwards, the number of calls per hour is actually fairly steady and constant across the days and all days of the week, but drops off after 8 pm except for Friday and Saturday evenings when demand rises. Julie has explored demand by shift patterns that the ambulance crews and paramedics tend to work. Uh, this graph, for example, shows demand by current shift pattern over a particular week. Now, Julie's gone on to develop some quite novel and sophisticated numerical methods for priority time-dependent cues, and some insights to the complexity of the equations are just given by this slide here. <clears throat> but her methods result in a neat and novel way to actually calculate the minimum staffing levels to meet that particular demand over the week. 
And furthermore, the tool goes on to assign ambulance crews to user-defined shift patterns. And these can be based on various objectives such as those shown here and different constraints on possible rosters depending on breaks and working hours of crews, for example. A roster is then produced for the ambulance service to use. And what's so neat about Julie's work is that all of these components are built into one single user-friendly spreadsheet tool for the ambulance service. So from initial forecasting of demand that links directly to the queuing theory and setting staffing levels and rosters of crews all in one package. We now look at location considerations and more specifically we look at where emergency vehicles should be optimally located within a region. And this could for example be suggesting the allocations for a given fleet size of ambulances to existing ambulance stations or possibly suggesting new locations including those on road networks where ambulances could be on standby. And I'm now going to summarize the work of Leanne who has used location theory and computer simulation to answer such questions. Consider a geographical region such as Southeast Wales shown here. The simulation tool that Leanne has built is entirely flexible and allows for demand nodes to be placed onto the map and that is where likely demand will come from and here the blue dots are based in fact on postcode districts and the numbers are in the blue dot that the user can define uh, indicate the demand over time and this captures the time dependent nature of demand that we saw in Julie's work. Now onto the map we place possible locations for our ambulances shown by the red dots and we can define a different a number of different types of vehicles initially located at each station or base uh, to, again to reflect our uh, shift patterns which links nicely to Julie's work. In practice there are two predominant types of emergency vehicle used in Wales a rapid response vehicle or paramedic that typically gets to the scene first in a fast car and an emergency ambulance that is able to transport people to hospital if required but which travels more slowly and in the model we can capture a distribution of time that the vehicle is on scene with the patient. And finally we add in the locations of the hospitals themselves where the ambulance might transport people or patients to hospital and also include information here about the turnaround times at the EMS and ED interface. Of course to be realistic we need to capture the travel times between different locations on the map this is then used to simulate the movement of emergency vehicles around the road network. And to facilitate this, a tool which utilizes Google Maps functionality has been developed, which on receiving postcodes returns a travel distance and travel matrix. And in fact, we have to slightly adjust these times to account for the different travel speeds of the different vehicle types. Now before giving a quick demo of the simulation tool, just to mention some other work we've been involved with, and that's looking at allocating vehicles based not just on um, uh, response time targets but on survival curve and trying to maximize survival. If you look, uh, think about the current target of eight minutes, anything less than eight minutes is considered a, a, a success, anything more than eight minutes is considered a failure. We hypothesize though that allocations based on survival curve, such as the one shown here on the right hand side for cardiac arrests, are more meaningful and potentially can lead to different decisions on allocations to maximize survival rather than just to minimize response time. And correspondingly, we have developed um, some new models which have ex extended the literature to build on different uh, survival curves for different types of vehicle and different uh, patient conditions. And these uh, optimal allocations can then be used in the simulation model. <coughs> in this brief demo, I'm going to illustrate the benefits on overall response times for the southeast region of Wales by using improved vehicle allocations across ambulance stations. So this is the uh, tool being opened now. It's a self-contained uh, tool and you can see so you can put journey times in there, information about demands, but we're going to experiment in this scenario just with the allocations of ambulances. This is a particular uh, ambulance station based in Cardiff and here are the existing number of emergency ambulances and rapid response vehicles over time for that particular station. Now we're going to run the simulation model. We're going to simulate one day in the life of the ambulance service for the whole region three times. So you see it runs very quickly. And we can look at a number of results, but we're just going to look at the overall performance. And we see that for the region as a whole, about 
of Category A calls are met within the 8 minute target. We're now going to go back to the same station at Cardiff. We're going to allocate different number of vehicles and, and different shift patterns. But we're importantly keeping the total number of vehicles the same across the region. So we're not increasing capacity, we're just allocating it in a different way. When we run the model again. And now we can see that the overall performance has gone up to about 63%. So we've got about a 9 to 10% improvement in our response time um, target simply by reallocating the existing um, number of vehicles in a different way, not by increasing capacity, but by, through a more efficient allocation. And that's a sizable improvement using the same capacity. And we're using these tools to explore various scenarios such as changes in demand, how the system copes with a major emergency event and how long it would take for the system to return to some stability, consequences in changing capacity and advice on desirable numbers and allocations, and coming back to the issue of turnaround time, what improvements to response times can be made by reducing the handover period between the ambulance and the ED? Just to finish on that point, Myself and Vince Knight have undertaken another piece of work uh, to look at this aspect. We consider the whole ambulance journey, that is the time that an ambulance is actually dispatched to an emergency until the time it is free again to respond to another call. And this diagram shows that ambulance journey as the ambulance travels to the patient, spends some time on the scene, if the patient then requires transportation to hospital and the turnaround time at the hospital. And what you notice straight away from the actual data that was used for this model is that the turnaround time down here has the largest single component of time, which is about half an hour currently. So on average, it takes about half an hour to uh, transfer the patient from the um, ambulance to the ED. And what Vince and I did was to fit uh, Coxian phase type distributions to the different components of the travel times and, and the turnaround times. And for those interested, this is the definition of a, or the function for a phase type distribution. The, uh, uh, in essence, this requires us to find a number of phases n in the Markov chain structure given at the bottom there, with exponential dwelling times in each phase that provides the best fit to the true distribution of observed service times. So we then fitted distributions to the different components, and we put it all into a priority queuing model with phase type service times uh, and ran various scenarios and you can actually, if you wish to, you can uh, look at that um, queuing uh, simulation model and it's available freely uh, on Vince's website. So we use the model to experiment with different turnaround times. This graph shows some illustrative results from the particular region. Uh, the blue line shows the, uh, that 15 ambulances are required in order for us to uh, meet the government set target of 65% of all uh, category A calls within the eight minute target. We now experiment with reducing turnaround times and this is a, a equivalent of removing some of the phases of the phase type distribution for the turnaround. Firstly we remove the excessive wait times uh, for very long um, transfer times. Well, that's about 5% of category A's are reduced and 8% of category B's and we see some marginal improvement in performance. But then very interestingly, if we go from the half an hour current average turnaround time down to the 20 minute time, which is actually the government target, then we see that our performance uh, improves drastically. We go from 65% uh, currently to about 77%, a 12% improvement in performance simply by reducing the turnaround time from 30 minutes on average to 20 minutes on average. And then we experiment even further, and this isn't perhaps unreasonable, but if we can have a turnaround time of about seven minutes for category A calls, the highest priority, and about five minutes for other categories, then remarkably, with the same capacity, we see our response time performance rocket to 95%. And so for the first time, we've been able to start to quantify for the ambulance service the benefits at the back end of the service in the turnaround times and how they actually will impact and assist the performance at the front end of the service in improving response time targets. Here are some um, uh, references that have arisen from the work 
and you can get more details also by looking at mine or Vince's website and they include other videos and slides of related talks such as redesigning the emergency department uh, Vince has done some game theoretical models exploring further the EMS and ED interface and I've been involved with a METSIM which is a tool being developed here in conjunction with the UK Met Office to forecast emergency admissions and bed occupancy based on weather patterns. So I hope you found that interesting and as I say please do look um, at our websites for further information or contact us if you would wish to do so and thanks for your attention.